Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, VIMS, which is our kind of framework for developing, kind of testing and optimizing new fragmentation strategies. Uh, so VIMS is a virtual metabolomics mass spectrometer. Um, it's basically a way of simulating full metabolomics LCMS MS experiments. So it's kind of got MS1 capabilities, MS2 capabilities, and you kind of simulate through an entire experiment and kind of get simulated, well, essentially get simulated results back. So VIMS is available in Python. If anyone wants to check it out, there is a GitHub link. So what is the point of VIMS? Uh, what is the point of a virtual mass spectrometer? Um, the point of it, at least in our, our eyes, is to uh, evaluate existing methods and settings. So for instance, one of the things we're interested in doing is how do you optimize top N, for instance? How do you choose the dyna dynamic exclusion window? How do you choose N? And how do you choose that for an individual experiment? So what you can also do is you can develop and evaluate new methods. So we spend a lot of time developing methods in VIMS, which can then be applied to real samples and then potentially be developed as a, as a full program later on. So we do have the ability to use VIMS to control a mass spec. So we have API access through kind of some of the thermo fission machines, though it's limited to that at the minute. And that does allow us to actually test these methods on kind of real samples as well as just our virtual ones. And finally, the kind of the thing I think it's maybe most useful for in the immediate future is kind of evaluating existing tools and methods. So MS Dial is one we're kind of interested in looking at. So VIMS works by having kind of two environments essentially with quite a lot of overlap between the two. So we have a simulated environment, which is the blue one at the top and a kind of a real environment, which is the bottom one. So in, this, in the simulated environment, we have a virtual mass spec. So it's basically a ton of Python code. And in the real one, we have an actual mass spec, which we're obviously controlling by sending it scan instructions. So the controllers which kind of implement these kind of scan instructions are consistent across both. So for instance, a top, top N controller will tell, it, tell the machine to do an either MS1 or MS2 or give it a list. And it'll do exactly the same for the virtual Python mass spec as well. So essentially it's just a bit of code that kind of splits the difference between, between the kind of VIMS and the machine or the fake machine. Um, so then we can obviously use real or fake samples. So for the simulations, what we tend to do is we tend to take an uh, existing MZML, so potentially a full scan of a sample that's already been collected. So we use uh, beer generally, because we're kind of just interested in the methods as such, rather than kind of actual clinical outputs. And what we can do is we can create ROIs, so regions of interest, and this is kind of standard kind of ROI building network that gets used within kind of your various peak picking tools. And we can convert these into VIMS chemicals, which we can then basically form a data set or a sample or a virtual sample. So we can use the timings from the MS1s and MS2s from our kind of previous experiments. And we basically generate synthetic MS2 spectra. So these aren't kind of anything real at the current stage. You could populate them from a database if you wish, but we tend at the minute just to generate them somewhat at random. The idea is essentially not to try and identify these, but to basically test whether in principle, if we use this method, could we get spectra for these metabolites? So we have things like top N implemented in VIMS, we have DIA methods as well, and we're developing our own. And the process works kind of the same for both. Once we run the experiment, the results get extracted as MZMLs. So whether it's simulated or real, you can still run it through some form of kind of evaluation process. Obviously, you can't go looking up the simulated chemicals in a database because they don't exist because they're, they're not real. So in terms of real experiments, it works exactly the same way, apart from we use a real sample instead of VIMS chemicals, and we're just simply uh, sending instructions to the mass spec. So as I said, it's kind of bridging code between our kind of Python implementation and the machine, but essentially it's some C++ code that kind of tells the machine what to do, and then it sends the results back and we process in real time. So kind of our implementation is a, a little bit slower than, than kind of the, the, the real, the, the, the natural implementation because we've kind of got this jump between Python and C++, but it's relatively fast and we're kind of, you're not talking about losing very many scans in a total experiment. But as I said, the controllers are identical across the two. So we've used VIMS for a variety of things and we see quite a lot of different applications in the future. So kind of, I've sort of talked about some of these before, but kind of, optimizing existing methods and developing new methods, either in single or multi-sample method, sample kind of situations or anything you can think of essentially. And we've also used it to compare DDA and DIA. And 
we're looking at kind of new DA deconvolution methods. But if you do have any suggestions of things you think it might be useful for, then please do give me a shout. Um, so the first thing we kind of used it for um, was to try and optimize DDA methods. So as I sort of mentioned before, we're interested in top N. So essentially what we can do is we can test the different load of different parameter settings, use some form of evaluation procedure to basically see how many chemicals we're able to get spectra for. So as I said, we can't compare to a database because these aren't real spectra, but we can say how kind of high, how good quality were these spectra assuming that if, if they were real. So the, the advantage of this is there's no machine time, there's no sample costs. So, you know, we can run thousands of different experiments uh, all offline. Obviously it takes a little bit of time, but there's no kind of sample costs, no machine costs. And we can basically optimize performance. So when we then have the optimized parameters, we can then use them in a real experiment. So we compared kind of optimization in BIMs versus kind of doing the exper same experiment in real life. And essentially saw the same thing. Um, so if we kind of run top top end on our simulator sample and we run top end on the same sample, but actually injecting the sample, we essentially get the same results, which kind of sort of says that BIMS is useful for this kind of thing. It can actually be used to do this. Uh, so the next thing we've kind of been doing is uh, developing new DDA methods. Um, so essentially our motivation here was to kind of avoid a situation like this where you have a single peak and you have multiple fragmentation spectra with the idea we wanted to aim for less kind of fragmentations of a single peak but at higher intensities and then use the additional scans to scan other peaks so essentially we're aiming for higher peak coverage ideally a higher intensity fragmentation event so we came up with this idea called smart roi so smart ROI basically tries to use a, a kind of its own kind of exclusion windows. So in the top one, when we have when we have top end, we have kind of uh, regular uh, MS2 scans, so the dotted lines, which are divided basically by a dynamic exclusion window. So we assume this is quite a big peak. Um, so we get end up with about four scans of the first peak and two of the second peak. So the idea of smart ROI is to only refragment things if we're likely to see an improvement in the quality of the spectrum. So we take our initial MS2 scan as per normal, and then we wait to see some kind of improvement in the intensity before we allow it to be triggered again. So an MS2 scan to be triggered again. Once we've had this fragmentation event at quite a high event, we then don't fragment again, because essentially we kind of consider there to be not much point because we already have a good quality spectra at that point. What we do then look for is whether it goes down enough that we then think we might've started another peak, which is the kind of the, the blue bit here. And then we're allowed to kind of go back to our sort of standard top end where we kind of fragment once we see a high enough intensity. And then we go through the process again. We also constructed something called uh, weighted dew. So instead of having your kind of standard, say 30 seconds dynamic exclusion window, what instead you have here is you have a 20 second dynamic exclusion window. Well, the second, the number is up to you. And then we have basically a kind of Another parameter which basically affects how likely we are to then refragment. So essentially what we can do here is we can take different values of this parameter and that basically scales down things that are still in that same ROI. So if we have a, so if we kind of have this, this option, so I think it's set to 100, we're basically very unlikely to refragment something. Um, and basically the weight looks like this thing at the top, right? So if you have uh, a one for being able to fragment, a zero for not being able to fragment, i.e. you're excluded, and then we have kind of our halfway, which is our kind of effect here. Um, so we developed these fully in BIMS, which is very useful because hundreds of bugs and obviously we managed to get rid of them all before we actually tried it on the machine. And we're also able to optimize our parameters like we did with top N. Um, we can also validate them in simulations, um, basically show that these methods are a lot better the more chemicals you get in a data set, which I guess is Intuitive, if you have a low number of chemicals, it's quite an easy challenge. If you have a high number, it's a high, harder challenge. And then we showed that in kind of a real, in a real sample, we kind of saw about a 50% improvement in the number of, of a number of peaks that we we're able to fragment. So essentially here, instead of being able to look at hundred metabolites in your database and have some success, here you have basically would be able to do 2000, or I think it's what, 
exaggerating the numbers a little bit, but essentially, you know, 50 to 70% extra. So as much as we haven't actually gone and looked these up in the database, essentially you have twice as many to look up. Therefore, you should end up with a lot more identifications. We've also been looking at uh, multi-sample DDA methods. So basically, how can we deal with samples that are very, very similar? And we like to see the same metabolites over and over again. So essentially, what we're interested in here is basically using an exclusion that can kind of jump across samples. So instead of, instead of repeatedly fragmenting the same peak in multiple samples, we basically try to drag the exclusion from the first sample into the second sample. Um, so this method is called top next. I'm not sure, I think that's how Ross wants it pronounced. Um, it's basically a, a framework which allows lots of these, lots of different things to basically score the different scans. So our whole framework basically works on scoring different possible scans. And this is kind of no exception, but this is kind of allows you to do things that work across entire sets of samples. Uh, so there's lots of different options. Um, Ross tried lots and lots of different things. Um, but essentially, it's, it's just a combination of different types of exclusions that work across within and across samples. So the kind of the main thing that, that kind of is implemented with this, this that essentially gives it the multi sample properties, this thing called non overlap. So essentially, if we have a, a current ROI, which is the, the black one that's kind of building in real time, but we know that from a previous sample, we've seen the blue ROI. So sorry, call it a peak box, essentially. We basically look at how much does our current ROI, so our black box, overlap with our previous box, which is our, our blue one. And if we see, if we know the blue one has been fragmented, we basically down, down weight the black ROI if it highly overlaps with the blue one. So essentially we're saying, if the peak lines up with something we've previously fragmented in another sample, massively downweight it and try and fragment other things instead. So it doesn't rule out the possibility of fragmenting the black, the black box, the current ROI, but basically it downgrades it and says, if there's anything better, go do that instead. And we also have a version that kind of works on that, but based on the intensity of the fragmentation events. So you don't see massive improvements uh, uh, in some of this. Uh, this is a, which one is this? Oh, this is a repeated injection of the same sample. So it works. Uh, it works pretty well, obviously, but it doesn't work massively better than top end exclusion. So that's kind of the left hand side is kind of basically the proportion of peaks we found. What we do see with our methods is we get a much higher fragmentation, fragmentation intensity for our spectra. And that's basically because we're allow instead of using a, an exclusion that basically fully blocks something out, we do allow you to go back and look at something if it's sufficiently of interest. Where you see a bigger advantage is if we use multiple different samples. Um, so the, sorry, the previous one was just 10 injections of the same beer. This is uh, 24 injections of six beers, I think. Uh, but what you see here is, a, is, a, is that all our methods tend to outperform things like the top end exclusion, which is, I guess is our baseline. So in this one, we're kind of looking at maybe a, a 10, 20% increase in performance, or at least in terms of peaks covered. And in terms of the, the quality of the, the actual fragmentation spectrum, we see a much bigger improvement. Uh, finally, just because I realize I've probably spent too long, uh, we can also do DIA in VIMS. Uh, it works exactly the same principle. Uh, we can design a DIA controller and we can run it across samples. We can run it across samples. It works exactly the same way. And we can design, if you wanted, you could design your own DIA methods and then run them on an instrument, which there's in theory a great plan, but I'll, there's a reason why it maybe doesn't quite make sense yet. Um, so we initially use this as a way of comparing DIA and DDA. Um, and what we tended to find is that kind of with existing methods for deconvolution, as soon as you get to a reasonable number of samples, all the estimates for the, the, the spectra of the DIA methods basically collapse and they basically have no similarity to what they're actually meant to be. Obviously top end has a lot less um, fragmentation spectra. So, I mean, this is kind of the accuracy of the ones we fragment. So, I mean, obviously DIA gets all of the peaks, top end gets half potentially in our samples. But essentially what I would argue here is that in the case of kind of two to 5,000 chemicals, all the results you get for DIA are probably not worth looking at because they're just not good enough quality. 
So VIMS kind of allows us here to actually look properly at whether these spectra are correct rather than kind of guessing by looking at databases because we're able to compare to truth or kind of our simulated spectra. Um, but to me, the, the bottleneck here would, would probably be the deconvolution methods. I think with, with, with kind of better, with better deconvolution methods, I think DIA could actually be much better than DDA for some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick whistle stop tour of kind of, of, of VIMS and what we've kind of been up to. Um, thank you to various collaborators, um, mainly at University of Glasgow and also Justin in the Netherlands. Um, if you do have any questions, obviously feel free to ask now. But my email and Twitter, and if you want the slides, they're on GitHub. That's what the first bit says it's covered up. So thank you. <laughs>